29. I'm not doing it. I refuse. This may be our only opportunity to study the aliens up close, Zenfor replied, standing near the back hatch of the shuttle. Please maneuver it into position so I may disembark. No, Jan replied. You got me to stay here, but if you think I'm docking with an alien ship just so we can find out what they're like, you're crazy. There could be an entire army waiting on the other side of that door for us, just hoping we'll be dumb enough to actually invite them in. She turned to Cass. Can you believe she actually wants to do this? He could. It made sense. The consul wanted as much information about the threat as possible. What better way to get it than to board their ship and find it for herself? Especially if her equipment wasn't working the way she wanted it to. But Cass couldn't blame Jan for not wanting to get any closer. They knew absolutely nothing about the species other than the fact they inhabited other parts of time. Whether it was for a nefarious reason or not was yet to be determined. But if his time near the XL Nebula had taught him anything, it was that you couldn't assume something had only benevolent feelings when you didn't know anything about it. From here on out, everything was a threat. Is there no other way to find out anything about them? Cass asked. Your sensors won't give me anything to work with. If I wasn't a sail ship, I'd at least be able to determine their level of technological advancement. As it is, I believe our best opportunity to learn about them lies beyond that hatch. And if it's a trap? Jan asked. Then we will know. And when our shuttle doesn't return... Tempest will have no choice but to conclude they killed us. Either way, the threat will be established. Fine. If we're doing this, then I'm setting the self-destruct on the shuttle. If they somehow gain control, they won't have it for long. And maybe with the shuttle right up against theirs, it will cause enough damage for Tempest to be able to pick it up. They already know we found the arch. That's an excellent idea, Captain, Zenfor said. Now please, move us into position. I can't believe this, Jan muttered. Suicide mission. Cass leaned over. I know this isn't what you were expecting, but I'm glad you're here. You're just determined to kill all of us pilots, huh? She said. Cass winced and pulled back. That stung. He turned away from her, trying to concentrate on keeping the dam holding back his flood of emotions from crumbling. She was right. Here he was, putting them at risk again. They should just go back. Zenfor was strong enough to overpower them. But she probably didn't know how to fly the shuttle. She'd need Jan for that much, at least. Shit, Jan said. I didn't mean that. It's just... When I'm not in my own ship, and when I find myself in another time stream, about to board an alien vessel, I get kind of worked up. She turned to him. I'm sorry. I know you're doing your best, like all of us. Cass gave her a small smile. Thanks. He stood and went to the back as she piloted the shuttle so it backed up to the alien ship. Even though she'd apologized, he still felt the underlying message probably one all the Space Wing pilots shared. With some, like Raffenkel, there was no question. Others, like Ryan out there, sitting on the other side of time, it might be buried deeper, but it was still there. Cass knew that, as sure as he knew anything. Opening the supply locker on the side, he retrieved three pistols and handed one to Zenfor, who only stared at it. He returned to the front and gave the second to Jan, while shoving the third into the back of his pants. She smiled, taking the weapon and placing it on her lap as she finished the sequence. We should get the Enviro suits, too. I highly doubt there will be any oxygen over there. Not to mention, we can't make... There was a knocking sound, along with a thud. Jan stared back at the controls. What the hell? That sounded like we just made a hard lock, Cass said. She checked her instruments. We did. But I don't understand how. This shuttle doesn't have a universal dock. It's only registered for coalition ships. It can't even dock with Sargantech. The best it can do is land in a base somewhere and hope it's pressurized. This shouldn't be possible. From what I could see, it looked as though the hatch appeared in response to the shuttle passing it. 
Perhaps it can configure itself to make a hard dock as well, Zenforce said, still holding her weapon awkwardly. What are you saying? They want us to come aboard? No, it may be automatic. It could be intentional, but we'll have no way of knowing until we go over there. Then we definitely wanted viral suits, Jan said, standing. I've set the auto destruct for thirty minutes. That should be more than enough time. She walked over to the locker past Cass and pulled three of the suits from inside. She handed one to Zen for, though it was painfully obvious she was much too tall to fit. Anything larger? she asked. Jan screwed up her face. I'm afraid not. But you can use one of these. She tossed Zen for a small device Cass recognized as a repel field. Clip it to yourself somewhere. It will form a small field around you that will at least prevent you from catching any diseases or large temperature changes. Though if there's no oxygen, I don't know what we can do. I can hold my breath for almost ten of your minutes, Zenfor replied, hooking the device to her belt. It should be enough to gather cursory information. Cass slipped into his enviro suit, not having worn one in quite some time. He hadn't had any on the reasonable excuse, because all his hab pods were self-sustaining. Had there been a breach, all he'd had to do was seal them all and use them as lifeboats. Probably the last time he needed one was when he'd escaped Cthora. He checked Jan's suit, and she did the same for him, confirming all their connections were in place. Zenfor activated a repel field, which produced a slight blue glow around her for a moment before dissipating. Are we ready? Cass asked. Jan held her weapon at her side, her focus on the door. Zenfor reached over and pressed the panel which retracted the door. It slid up into the top of the shuttle to reveal a portal to the ship exactly the same size as their port. It even vaguely looked like Coalition Tech. You said this material was mimetic, Cass said. Does that mean it can also detect other technology? Emulate it somehow? It would be a wonder if it could, Zenfor said. She stepped forward to the hatch on the other ship. Cass moved to stop her, wanting to prepare himself for what might be on the other side. But she moved too quick, and he braced himself, aiming his weapon to the portal. Instead of sliding, it melted away into nothingness, revealing a cavernous space beyond. Cass activated the light on his enviro suit, and Jan did the same, as the space beyond was dark, save a few sources of light along the walls, though they didn't exactly look like any kind of light Cass had seen before. They seemed to almost be concentrations of the hull, as there was little discernible difference between them and the side of the ship itself. At least they have lights, Cass said. If Zenfor heard him, she didn't look back. He'd never forget how absolutely alien the sill ship had seemed without any light to illuminate it. Even when he found his flashlight, the place was strange. This was more like what he was used to, though the technology was far more advanced than anything he'd seen before. They took a few steps into the ship, and Cass's indicator on his suit told him there was an oxygen atmosphere inside. Oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere. Not exactly what we need, but as long as we don't need to run really fast, we can breathe it. The air is just a little thinner than we're used to. Thinner than you're used to, Zenfor said. I think I'll just keep my helmet on, Jan said, looking around. Because there's probably a pretty good chance we're going to be running from something before it's over. She had a point. Cass opted to keep his helmet on, too. They moved slowly through the space. It reminded Cass of one of the bays, though there were no other shuttles around. In fact, for such a large space, there was nothing around. No supplies, no containers, and no crew. What could they do with all of this space? And why would they need so much if they weren't going to use it? Are you getting anything on your scanners? Cass asked. Faint energy signatures. More than we got outside the ship. No life signs yet. Zenfor was walking ahead of them, moving faster than Cass cared to. He picked up the pace, and Jan stayed in step with him, checking behind them every few seconds to make sure they weren't followed. I wonder if there's no one aboard, Jan said. Maybe that's why the ship didn't react to us entering the time bubble. Cass couldn't be sure. 
but he didn't feel like it had been abandoned. He'd been on abandoned vessels before, and they were typically a lot dirtier than this. Grit and grime had piled up over years of disuse. And while it was possible they only left recently, he still didn't think that was the case. Though he couldn't put his finger on why. The giant area was interrupted every ten meters or so by a giant pillar that seemed to grow right out of the floor itself all the way to the ceiling high above them. Above, there were second and third floor catwalks, wide enough for at least a couple of human-sized people to traverse at the same time. Cass kept looking up, expecting to see a face staring back down at him, but all he saw was empty space. "'What are we looking for?' Jan asked. "'Anything,' Senvor replied. "'Anything that will tell us who they are and what they want, what their plans are.' "'How long until the shuttle blows?' Cass asked. "'Twenty-four minutes, thirty-seven seconds,' she replied. "'Zenfor, let's hurry it up. "'We still have to get back to the shuttle,' Cass said. "'In response, Zenfor picked up speed, "'walking faster down the large space. "'When she reached a wall, she turned to the left, "'following something on her diagnostic device. "'What? What is it?' Cass asked. "'I'm picking up plasma energy,' she said. "'Plasma energy could be one of a hundred different things.' It could be burn-off from the ship's engines. Or it could be the fuel the species used to power their engines. Or it could be a salad dressing, for all Cass knew. What he was certain of was they were getting deeper and deeper into this alien ship. And so far, he'd seen no sign of anything that could help them out. Here, come quickly, Zenfor said, breaking into a trot. Cass and Jan exchanged glances. And while Jan matched her pace, Cass aimed his weapon behind them and ran backward, not wanting the sudden movement to spook anything in here. It was like being in a cave of bats and not knowing what might set them off. They passed through a portico, and for a second Cass suspected it might look like the arch they'd seen outside. But as far as he could see, there was no resemblance. It was just a regular pass-through in the wall, nothing special. He turned to see Zenfor standing over a pillar in the middle of the floor, it was about a meter and a half tall, completely smooth and round in appearance, and looked as though it had grown from the floor. There was nothing to indicate it was bolted down, or even a separation of deck plating. What is it? Cass asked. Jan scanned the room, both hands on her weapon, as she checked the high spots, looking for anything that might indicate an ambush. I'm not sure, Zenfor replied. She reached out and touched the top of the pillar, and the room was filled with bright spots of light. Cass and Jan ducked down at the same time. Had they activated an alarm? Or something that might hold them here? He checked the portico they'd walked under. It was still open and clear. Once he forced himself to focus, Cass realized the room wasn't filled with spots, but what seemed to be holographic representations of the system they were in, with the red and blue giant stars at the center. He stood slowly and moved to the closest object in the room to him. It's not a hologram, he said, running his gloved hand over the small surface of the star itself. And it's warm. It's giving off its own heat. It's a map of this system. But look, Zenfor said, who hadn't ducked down. She pointed to a part of the room where a bright red sphere indicated the location of the ship they were on. The three of them approached it, Cass cautious. It was very small in relation to the rest of the system, because as far as Cass could tell, everything was in scale. Zenfor reached out and touched the sphere, and it expanded in size, filling up a larger part of the room to where they could all see the ship they were on more clearly. Is this? Jan asked, pointing to the side of the ship. There, right where they docked, was a representation of their shuttle. Is this a live image? Everything was there. The arch they'd come through, Ryan's space wing on the other side, as well as Tempest, and all the other shuttles in the system performing their searches. However, everything on the other side of the arch seemed frozen, while the ship they were on drifted softly. I believe it is, Zenfor said. She reached out and touched the representation of the ship they were on, her fingers running down the side, this is phenomenal technology. 
to recreate in such detail in real time. It's fascinating, but how does it help us? Cass asked. We're on a schedule here. Zenfor shot him a look, but then approached the art, tapping it with her hand. Behind her and all around the system, similar arches revealed themselves. Holy! Are all those passageways into time bubbles? Cass asked. There was at least a dozen of them, scattered through the system itself. I would assume so, she replied. But that isn't what is most interesting. Look, she pointed to an area inside the orbit of one of the planets. It was an artificial structure of some kind. But if everything was still in scale, it had to be massive. It was as if someone had taken pyramids and attached them to all six sides of a cube. It's a tetrahexahedron, Jan said. Cass stared at her in surprise. What? I like geometry. So what? Whatever you call it matches the construction of the arches. But not this ship, Zenfor said. I think we are dealing with two different civilizations here. Two civilizations? Not one that has evolved over a long period of time? Cass asked. I don't think so. But according to this map... I don't see any other ships, bases, or anything else like the ship we are currently on. There's no indication of an armada. Does that mean it was a ruse? There never was a fleet of ships headed for the Coalition? I don't know, but we need more information. And we should plan another expedition to that structure out there. She pointed to the Pyramid Cube. Um... Jan said, standing off to the side close to the image of Tempest. What are these? Beside the ship were what looked like a small series of orbs. Though they were so dark, Cass hadn't seen them at first. There were three in a row. He estimated approximately a few kilometers off Tempest's starboard bow. The light from the stars in the middle of the room had caught them, giving their polished black surfaces a sheen that had revealed them. Cass approached and inspected them. I don't know, but they don't appear to be moving. Could they be sensor arrays? He looked around the rest of the room. I don't see any others. Here's one, Zenfor said. It was positioned behind one of Tempest's shuttles. And more. Jan pointed to another shuttle, this one with a space wing escort. That's Coley's ship. I recognize that stupid bird she painted on the side. So they're what? Following our ships? Cass asked. Either that, or they're acquiring their targets. Cass's chest went tight. She was right. If it was some kind of trap, they probably had a beat on every one of the shuttles and space wings out there right now, as well as Tempest. Can we get back in time to warn them? Zenfor studied the map. I think so. As soon as we return to normal time, everything should sync up again. They might have time to avoid them, assuming they can shake them at all. How have none of them reached their targets yet? Those shuttles have been out there for hours, Jan asked. They'd have to be the most inefficient missiles I've ever seen, if that's what they are. Let's not leave it to chance, Cass said. Can you learn anything else from this map? He stared at Zenfor. Not in the time we have. Then let's get back and make it quick. Thirty. Laura jogged behind as Box, Zax, and two other nurses guided Evie on the hovering gurney down the hallway toward engineering. She thought her heart had never beat so hard. Not only was she scared to death of what might happen to her, but she was also physically exhausted. She hadn't slept ever since coming to sick bay to see Evie and had forgotten to eat anything. And now nothing but adrenaline and sheer force of will propelled her down the corridor. Evie continued to thrash in the gurney, screaming out every few moments that she couldn't get away, and each time she did, Laura's heart broke a little more for her. All she wanted was to give her the peace she needed. In her mind's eye, she willed them to run even faster. Zax had called ahead to let Engineering know they were coming, and for Sester to prepare himself. Laura wasn't sure what the Klaxian could do. She'd heard they were psychic, but that was a long way from being able to help repair damage inside her mind somewhere. 
Whatever was causing the problem, Laura wasn't sure it could be fixed. She hoped it could. She hoped she was wrong. Right, Zack said, and the entire unit of four people and Gurney turned at once, then picked up pace through the wide space. People on either side jumped out of the way, and Laura caught some of their faces as she passed. Some were concerned, others outright surprised, and a few were awash in pity. Evie would probably hate that. It was a good thing she wasn't lucid enough to know what was going on around her. Almost there. Clear the blast door, Zax announced. Ahead of them, the massive rolling door to engineering moved aside, revealing the large space beyond. The primary engineering team, led by Ensign Tyler, moved aside as Zax helped maneuver Evie into place. Laura hadn't spent much time in engineering. She was more comfortable up in the science labs, and more recently in the training arenas where she could run her tactical simulations. But it was nonetheless impressive. Commander Sester raised himself out of his cradle and rolled toward them on all five of his appendages, like a wheel with spokes and no rim. He stopped and bent down to inspect Evie. Though, since he had no eyes, Laura wasn't quite sure how. It's simple. I'm seeing inside her mind. Laura let out a small scream, then clamped her hand over her mouth, trying not to draw attention to herself, though Box looked back at her anyway. Had... had the commander just spoken to her? Inside her mind? I'm pleased you can understand me, Lieutenant. Not everyone can. Unfortunately, Commander Diazol is one of those whom I find it difficult to reach. Do you think you can help? Zax asked, staring up at the Klaxian. He says he's not sure, Ensign Tyler said, stepping forward. Laura couldn't be sure, but she detected a hint of gray in Tyler's hair she hadn't noticed before. He wasn't much older than her, if any. Maybe the pressure of being in charge of engineering after Commander Blom died had prematurely aged him some. If he can't do it, no one can, Zack said, holding her top two hands together while the bottom two continued to grasp the gurney while Evie still squirmed. Lieutenant, I sense you know the commander well. Is there anything you think might be helpful? Putting aside the fact there was an alien mind inside her own right now, Laura tried to focus on something Evie might have done or said that could be contributing to her problem. Had she been having issues before she went down to visit her father? Laura didn't think so, and she'd known the encounter hadn't gone well. Could that have something to do with it? Thank you, Lieutenant. I will give that a try. Oh, but I didn't... Everyone turned to her at once, except for Sester. Clearly, she was the only one receiving his thoughts. What's that, Lieutenant? Zax asked. Nothing, Laura said. Sorry, I was just thinking out loud. Zax sighed. This would be better if there weren't a dozen people standing around gawking. Tyler, get your people back to work, and could you have any non-essential personnel wait outside? Tyler nodded and began giving orders. Zax turned back to Laura. That goes for you, too. I know you want to be close to her right now, but Sester needs zero distractions. Uh, sure, yeah, Laura said, her stomach dropping. She didn't want to leave. What if Sester needed some other crucial bit of information? Don't worry. If I need anything, I will tell them to fetch you. This may take some time. I will do my best to take good care of her. He's never done anything like this before, but he says he'll try his best, Tyler said. He's having a hard time reaching her through her memories to hopefully gain access. Laura turned and followed the four other engineers out through the large entrance, which rolled closed behind them. Bar? One of them, a junior crewman with a shockingly handsome face, asked. Two of the others shrugged and murmured agreements before following him. The fourth stood by the door, waiting at her post. She locked eyes with Laura a second before averting them again. Friend of the commander? she asked. Something like that, Laura replied. You hurt Sester in your head, didn't you? Her eyes caught Laura's again. She nodded. The first time I heard him, I almost peed myself. You get used to it. Thanks, Laura said. But she didn't feel like making small talk. All she wanted was to be in engineering, holding Evie's hand, until Sester could find a way to help her, to fix whatever was wrong.
That nervous energy was bubbling up inside her again, despite how tired she was. She checked to make sure her comm was active. I think I'm going to go for a short walk. The engineer nodded. She'll be okay. Laura only gave her a small smile in return as she turned in the other direction and made her way down the hallway. She remembered seeing a face in her vision. Then it was gone again, and the creature was back. Then she was being propelled somewhere, wind rushing over her skin. And yet the creature persisted in holding her down and gnashing at her face as if it were a wild animal. And no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get it off. But then she was somewhere else. It was a familiar place, but somewhere that didn't feel like home. She'd lost her mind. It had finally happened. Something in her had snapped, and she just finally lost it. Whatever her father had done to her had broken her in some way, and there was no coming back. Evie crouched down, her hands covering her face as she wept. Commander? Evie glanced up to see a man she didn't recognize. And yet she did. He was familiar in a strange way, though she couldn't put her finger on it. He had a kind face, though it was completely devoid of any hair, and his eyes were as white as the sun. Either he had no pupils, or they blended in so well she couldn't see them. But the smile on his face told her everything was okay. He reached out a strong hand to her, and she took it, allowing him to help her up. Don't be afraid, he said. His voice. She'd heard it only once before. When she'd been... In engineering. Sester? He glanced down at himself, seemingly almost as surprised as she was. Is this how you see me? he asked, holding out his arms to inspect himself. He had on well-fitting, but at the same time flowing clothes, a light beige in color, and sandals to match. Where are we? she asked. We're in the fields of our minds. Call it a mind space. Your condition is deteriorating. Dr. Zax asked if I could help. Evie jerked with a start, glancing all around her. The creature was nowhere to be seen. For that matter, she couldn't see much at all, except the distant horizon that barely separated the white of the sky from the light gray of the ground. What's happening to me? You're having hallucinations, Sester said, and they're becoming debilitating. I want to help you before it causes permanent damage. I... She continued to survey the landscape, as barren as it was. The harder she looked, the more things came into focus. The gray ground turned into beige dirt covered with rocks and desert plants, while the sky morphed into a brilliant blue. In the distance, a range of mountains capped by snow stood, their sharp peaks a contrast to the flat landscape before them. What is this place? Sester asked. I've never been somewhere like this. It's Sisk, she said without thinking, where I grew up. Under her feet, the dirt transformed into a paved surface, leading in two directions. And why are we on Sisk? he asked. I, I don't know, she replied, though she had an idea. And it wasn't one she wanted to explore. She already recognized the road. It was the one that led to her old home at the edge of Grast, the central city on the Third Continent. As she turned around, she could see the city itself rising from the ground as if being pushed up from beneath. It formed into place perfectly, as it had been the day she'd last seen it, thirteen years ago. The system star Hommel burned bright in the sky. There was no cloud cover to speak of, and she could already feel the sun burning her arms. Come on, we have to get out of this midday sun, she said, taking off in a trot along the road. It's easy to burn if you're not careful. The best time of the day to be out is twilight or dawn. Sister ran beside her toward the city, though it shimmered away, and in its place her old home took its place. No, not there. What is it? Sester shielded his white eyes from the sun with his hand. It's my house. Evie looked behind her, but there was no trace of the city anymore. 
only unending desert. Hamel wasn't giving them any breaks. They needed to get inside. She could already feel her skin cooking. Damn! They took off on a trot to the house, Evie taking a long breath as soon as they entered its shadow. I used to challenge myself as to how long I could stay out here in the middle of the day, she said, pointing to what amounted to a yard in front of the house. Stayed out too long one day and got some really bad sunburn. Dad wasn't too happy about that, she said. Why are we here? Sister asked. My father just died, she said, and I think, I don't know, but I think something happened to me when he did, or just before he did. He did something to me, and nothing's been right since. She bent over, her hands on her knees as she stared at the house. I don't want to go in there. I'm here with you, Sester said, placing his hand on her back. It was cool to the touch. I'll help. She took a few deep breaths. Something about this was very strange. She hadn't seen any of these visions before Sester had shown up. It had always been the gray creature every time. Okay, she said. Stay close. I don't know what we're going to find in there. Sester nodded. Evie placed her hand against the small pad beside the door, and it opened with an audible click. She pushed it aside slowly and stepped into the cool, climate-controlled foyer. It wasn't anything magnificent, but it was expansive enough to allow light in from the windows above the door, which illuminated the space. In front of them was a staircase that led to the second floor, while to the right and left were a sitting room and dining rooms, respectively. Beside the staircase, the hallway led into the back of the house. She could hear the faint hum of Norconian opera, as she did every day she came to this place. It was exactly as she remembered. He'll be in the back, she told Sester. Who? My father. Just saying the words aloud sent a shudder down her back. She reached out and took Sester's hand as she made her way down the hallway to the back of the house. A small kitchen was off to the left, and there, with his back to her, was her father, working away at one of his reports. The scene was peaceful and serene, and could remain that way as long as she didn't bother him. Evelyn, he asked, not turning around, home from school so late? Because of its close sun, most activities only operated at night, which included school. Many people used the day to sleep. She approached, taking each step with care. She reached out for him, and as she did, the scene shifted around her, as if someone had shaken an hourglass as everything dissipated. Her father turned, but it wasn't her father any longer. Instead, it was the gray creature, and Evie jumped back as it turned to face her, its dark eyes boring into her. She stumbled back and let go of Sister's hand, and the creature lunged for her. Her back hit the ground, which was, at the same time, the floor of her childhood home and not as the image of the house flickered in and out like a bad sensor signal. The creature moved to push her down, and she swung, connecting with its jaw. No! she yelled. But it didn't phase the creature. He grabbed her arms and shoved her down, positioning himself over her. Sester! Commander, you can do this. Don't let your panic engulf everything else. What was she supposed to do, just let it happen? That was unacceptable. I'm not going to just let... No, Sester said. You have the strength to beat it, but you have to focus. Don't let the fear distract you. She stopped thrashing and stilled her mind. She had the strength. This wasn't her father, and he no longer had any power over her. Evie gritted her teeth and surged, breaking the creature's hold on her and knocking it back on its gray ass. As she stood staring over it, she realized its lips were moving. She didn't commit suicide. She didn't commit suicide. She didn't... A cold chill ran down Evie's back. The creature with its strange voice disappeared, as did the house, the desert, the city, the ground, the planet, all of it. And Evie was floating in open space, staring at a very green planet she'd never seen before. It was a terrestrial planet, but it had rings around it, also tinged a dark green. 
and two moons in close orbit. Evie glanced behind her to see Sester floating there as well. I don't understand, she said. What is this? I don't know, he replied. They were yanked toward the planet, and she found herself falling through the atmosphere at impossible speeds. At this rate, her body should have burned in seconds, but they were still intact. And instead of hitting the ground with the force of a bomb, she and Sester landed softly on the top of a verdant hill, where below stood hundreds, if not thousands, of the gray creatures staring up at them. Are these? she began, but couldn't finish the sentence. They were whisked away again, just as fast, to an entirely different planetary system. Faster than they could be taken by an undercurrent, faster than using the sill's jump points. They were floating yet again, though this time Evie recognized the system. It's Omicron Terminus, she said. What are those? Sester asked, pointing to the small black spheres inhabiting the system. They shouldn't be able to see them against the darkness of space itself, but somehow she could. I think they're... Mines, Evie said. Are you sure? Sester asked. I don't know why, but yes, I'm sure. Thirty one. Halfway back to the shuttle, Cass would have bet a hundred aliens would jump from the ship's shadows and stop them in their tracks. But the trip back had been as uneventful as their voyage into the ship, despite the fact he was even more on edge and they made it back to their shuttle with time to spare. Disengaging the self-destruct, Jan removed her helmet and took the pilot's seat. Zenfor returned to her station while the shuttle's door slid closed. Cass couldn't be sure, but he thought he saw movement on the other side of the door before it completely closed, though it could have just been their side of the door rematerializing or doing whatever it did. He didn't care, they needed to get back over to the right side of time to warn everyone about the spheres. Did he get a good scan of the position of all those things? He asked Zenfor. Uploading it into the system now. We should have a map when we return. Good. Because with as many that were out there, I think we're going to need it. Somehow they'd made it into the system without disturbing any of the spheres. But now they were everywhere, blocking off any kind of exit without a very precise exit strategy. Cass couldn't help but think they'd been lured here, either by the Andromeda aliens or by someone else. But regardless, they couldn't stay if the ship was in danger. They could come back and explore this layer of time later, assuming, that was, that they could return at all. We're free of docking, Yan said. For a second there, I wasn't sure it was going to let us go. Why is that? Cass asked. Because something about all of this isn't right. She took a breath, plotting a course back to the arch. Think about it. We get a signal from deep space that tells us an alien armada is en route to our home. Not just the coalition, but Earth. We get out here only to find one seemingly abandoned ship, no armada, and then it just gave us the map to get out of here? How does any of that add up? He had to admit he wasn't sure. There was more than one mystery here but the important thing at the moment was to warn the other shuttles and Tempest before one of those spheres brushed up against someone's hull. Cass had a very bad feeling about those. Nearly invisible spheres weren't deployed into a system unless you wanted to slow or stop anyone from coming or going. We'll be there in just a minute, Jan said. Looks like Riot is still on the other side. Cass glanced up. It was true. Ryan hadn't moved from where he'd stationed himself when they went in. Does he have one of those spheres near him? He asked. Not according to my map data, Zenfor replied. Okay. As soon as we get across, I'm going to send a general alert and transmit the map to everyone at once so they can avoid these things. It's a miracle no one has hit one so far. Closing in, Jan said as the arch loomed large before them. Cass was still struck by just how massive it was, spanning the two moons. He wished they'd had time to get a better look. Below him, the deck plating vibrated, and he had to hold on to the sides of his chair to keep from shaking away from it. Little rougher coming out than going in, Jan narrowed her eyes and focused on the far side of the arch. The ship continued to rumble until finally they were on the other side. Manning the comm units, Cass's feed was inundated with messages. Calypso, report your position. Calypso, what happened? 
I've lost you on screens. Come in, anyone. Cass glanced up in time to see Ryan's space wing pull itself right beside them. What the hell? he asked. What happened to you guys? You couldn't see us? Cass asked. No. You were beside the moon one second, then you were gone. And then, almost as soon as you disappear from screens, you reappear coming the other direction? Wait a second, Cass said, looking back at Zen 4. We were only in there a few seconds? Yeah, that's... His comm was cut off by a priority communication coming through from Tempest. Mayday! Mayday! We've been hit! All ships converge on Tempest! I repeat... The comm cut off, and Cass glanced over to see three massive explosions on the side of Tempest, right where the black spheres had been. Oh my god, Jan said. The ship listed to the side as another explosion impacted the side. Fire and debris littered the space around the hits. Get us back there now, Cass yelled. Jan hit the accelerator, and Ryan did the same, pointing a target right back to the ship. Transmit that map. Tell everyone to be on the lookout for these things. They are definitely mines. Zenvor nodded. Sending now, she said. There was another explosion to their right, as a shuttle disappeared off the screen, its accompanying space wing barely missing the blast. Just lost the Tegatus, Jan said. They must have hit one. This whole thing has been nothing but a trap, Cass yelled. They lured us in here and made us think they're hiding, but they're not even here at all. I know why we were able to avoid the mines before we entered the arch, Zenfor said. He turned to her. According to the records incoming from all the other shuttles, they only appeared as soon as we passed through. When we entered, they activated. Before that, they were invisible, or at least inactive. Great, Cass said, turning back to see Tempest now on her back, still turning from the force of the explosion. He tapped the comm. Tempest, we're coming in. Does anyone read me? This is Rabo on the Calypso. There was no response on the other end. Are they receiving us? I'm not sure. But Tempest isn't transmitting anything now. The damage might have knocked out the communications array, Jan said. Can you get us in there without the flight controllers? Cass asked. She shot him a smirk. Easy. Her hands worked the controls, so the shuttle began to roll and pitch to match Tempest spinning. Riot? Help get the rest of the shuttles back safely, Cass said. They don't need to be out here in this minefield. We found what we're looking for. You got it, Ryan replied, and the space wing peeled off. Cass tapped his personal comm. Maybe just the main system was out, but the person-to-person -person comms might still work. Evie? What's going on in there? There was no response. That wasn't good. Cass's heart rate picked up again despite the fact his stomach had been in his throat ever since he'd seen those four explosions on Tempest. He couldn't get a good look, but at least it seemed like emergency force barriers might be holding, as no more debris was exiting into space. But he didn't want to think about how many of the crew they lost in those explosions. One was closer to the center of the side of the ship, where the bridge was located. "'Captain Green, do you read me?' Cass asked. Still no response." He tried not to let the worst situation implant itself in his mind. He couldn't let himself think about anything other than getting back to the ship and getting it under control, and hopefully get out of this mess. Everyone, hang on to something, Jan said. We're heading in. Evie awoke to the shudder of the ship as she was thrown from her gurney. Just before she hit the ground, she managed to get her hands out in front to brace her fall. Alarms blared all over engineering. Wait, why was she in engineering? She glanced up to see Zax and Bach struggling to get up as well. Sester climbed back in his cradle, engaging with the ship's systems. We have two confirmed breaches, Tyler yelled. Decks four and seven. Another explosion rocked the ship again, throwing Evie back to the ground. She forced herself to get up to assess what was going on. There's a third breach on deck eleven, sir. Someone yelled. Seal all compartments, Evie managed to order, despite she was having trouble finding her balance. The last thing they needed was an explosive decompression from damage due to an adjoining section. Eleven was only one deck below them. Confirmed, someone said. Evie tapped her personal comm. Bridge, report. 
There was nothing on the other end. Sax came over and inspected her head, holding it between two of her hands while running a third across her hairline. Bridge? Internal comms are down, Commander, Tyler said from his station. We're cut off from the rest of the ship. There was another explosion. But Evie had been ready this time and grabbed onto the nearest station, keeping herself upright and holding Zax at the same time. Are those incoming weapons or something else? She yelled. Unknown. We don't have eyes on the outside of the ship down here. Evie ran over to Tyler's station. Raise full defensive barriers and reinforce the armor plating of the sections that aren't damaged. Yes, ma'am, Tyler said, ordering his people to their jobs. The commander says we've lost all engine power and are adrift, Tyler called out. I need to see what's happening out there, Evie said. But she was stopped by Box, who indicated Zax behind her. Commander, are you... I don't have time for this, Evie said. The ship is under attack, and we don't have any idea if we're going to be here in the next five minutes. I think my metal state can take a break. Not if you're compromised, Zack said. I need to know if I should relieve you of duty. Several heads turned in her direction. Evie took a deep breath, preparing to lay into the doctor. Only she stopped a moment. She remembered where she and Sester had been, the planet, then here, in this system. The alien creature was gone from her mind. Was that what it had meant to show her? Visions of some alien world? But how had it gotten into her head in the first place? Whatever the source, she could deal with that later. What was important was she felt better than she had ever since they left Cypaxia. Whatever Sester did, I think it worked, she said. For the moment, I'm fine. Can I get back to work now? Sax regarded her a moment, then stepped to the side. Evie glanced at Box, whose eyes blinked a few times in succession. She supposed that was about as good of an endorsement as she was going to get. Do we have eyes outside? What's going on out there? she asked. We can't communicate with any of the shuttles, Tyler said, but I'm not detecting any enemy ships anywhere in the vicinity. I don't know what hit us, but it tore through the bulkheads easily. Damage report coming in, Commander, Crewman Alaksha said. Full compression lost on deck 11, 22 missing or dead, and the primary energy conduits have been ruptured. We can't move until they're repaired. Can you find a workaround? Reroute? I'm working on it, Alaksha replied. She needed to get to the bridge, find out what was happening up there. Engineering wasn't suitable for a full operations report, and without the bridge relinquishing control, she couldn't run the ship from down here. But without comms, the only way to find out what was happening up there was to physically take the trip. She stared at the giant rolling door that led to the rest of the ship. What are the odds I can leave? We don't know the extent of the damage yet, ma'am, Tyler said. I wouldn't go until we can be sure we won't lose the bulkheads between us and Eleven. If they rupture, he didn't have to finish. Opening that hatch could put the entire engineering section at risk. And if they lost engineering, then the ship itself was a total loss. Fuck, she said. 32. Zenfor braced herself as the pilot Jan matched the shuttle's rotation with that of Tempest and drove them straight into the bay. She had to admit it was an impressive bit of flying, worthy of a sill counterfighter, though now they had much larger problems to worry about. Zenfor feared all of this could have been avoided had they never entered the archway, but something nagged at the back of her mind. The mines had been much too far away to hit Tempest when they'd seen them on the map display on the alien ship. So how had they struck the ship so soon after they'd returned through the arch? Something didn't make sense about it, and she was determined to find out what it was. Once this crisis was over. Jan brought the shuttle down into one of the spots in the bay, opening the hatches to the yells of the bay crews on the other side. As soon as they were down... Jan and Caspian were out of their seats and through the exit, into the chaos of the bay itself. Zenfor followed close behind, making sure to grab the primitive diagnostic device that had taken a copy of the map from the alien ship. Here! Over here! Zenfor glanced over to see Chief Ravenkel waving for them. All three broke out in a trot to her. She was helping a human whose arm had been crushed by a falling container crate. Get this thing off him! Zenfor and the three humans all got under the crate, and with her additional strength, lifted it from him, only to find a bloody mess of an arm underneath. 
It had been completely crushed. My core, Jan said, as they set the box down on the other side of him. What happened? Cass demanded. I don't know. I just got back myself, Raffenkel said. As soon as I jumped out of my wing, I saw this guy, everyone running around him. I can't reach anyone, and the flight control deck is empty. With her head, she motioned to the glass windows above the bays. She took off her flight jacket and wrapped it in a makeshift tourniquet around the man's bloody stump of an arm. I think the comms are down. Did you see the explosions? Cass asked. I was on the other side of the system. I only came back when Ryan gave me the rundown. Senfor glanced behind them. More shuttles were arriving in the bays. It seemed the map was working, and they were avoiding many of the mines. Come on, Cass said, tapping Zenfor. We need to get to the bridge. He turned to Jan. Good flying. Get him to sickbay, and make sure those force barriers don't come down. He pointed to the end of the bays where two more shuttles came in with their escorts and landed. What else are we going to do? Leave him here to bleed to death, Raffenkel said, snark in her voice as she grabbed the man under his shoulders. Caspian took off of the main exit, running at what she assumed was his full speed, though it didn't take much for her to keep up. With the internal comms down, they had no way of knowing what was happening anywhere else on the ship, which also meant they didn't know which sections were potentially damaged or open to space. Had this been a sill ship, she would have known any and all damage immediately, as the ship would have transmitted the information neurologically to every member of the crew through their suits. This was very inefficient. Come on, Caspian said. We need to get to the bridge. See if we can regain control of the ship. And make sure everyone's not dead, Zenfor said. They're not. How can you be so sure? Why else would the ship be adrift? She was wrong. He hadn't been running at his full pace before because he managed to speed up. She kept up with him until they reached part of the corridor that had been blocked by debris from two floors above. Up and over, he said, climbing. A few crew members were attempting to move the debris, and they yelled at Cass as he made his way over, making their job more difficult. Wait, Zenfor said, and Cass climbed back down. She grasped one end of one of the main beams blocking their way and yanked it until it came loose, the crew looking on in wonder. This was why she was consul. She was the strongest and most agile of her crew, as well as the smartest. These people seemed willing to select anyone to lead them. She was grateful her own people weren't like that. There, she said, tossing the piece of metal aside. It had made a dent in the debris, enough so part of it had collapsed, making traversing over it much easier. Thanks, Cass waved back at her. Come on. She could hear the crew murmuring, no doubt impressed with her strength. She was glad she could show them what a real captain was supposed to look like, though she couldn't help but think it was a title she wouldn't have much longer, not after Moles learned of her deeds. Caspian reached the hypervader first, but once he was inside, it wouldn't respond to his commands. Damn. I think the route to the bridge must be blocked. Hang on. He studied the panel's interface, then began programming a complex set of variables into the control device. A little light beside it turned green. Bridge, he said. The doors closed, sealing them in. What did you do? Zenfor asked. I had to route along another hypervader path. They're all connected, so we just had to take the long way around. Otherwise, we would have had to take the access tubes. And sorry, but I don't think you'll fit through those. They're uncomfortable enough for someone of my size. You no longer seem so anxiety-ridden, she said, ever since the alien ship. That's true, he replied. I had that thought as well. I guess when there's a crisis, I don't have time to think about it. The hypervader shuddered, which was the first instance Zenfor had ever experienced of that happening. Don't worry. That's just the car switching its tracks. A moment later, the doors opened on the bridge, which was in terrible shape. Smoke filled the room, but not so much she couldn't see. Zal, Uma, and Wolf all remained at their stations, though Wolf and Uma were covered in human perspiration, and Uma's lip was bleeding. Zal, while he remained at his station, he'd lost his hard light projection, and the exoskeleton under his robe was clearly visible as it operated his controls. 
In the front, Lieutenant Rod was slumped over his station, though Zenfor couldn't tell if he was dead or not. Ensign River seemed to have taken over his job, as she was working hard at navigation. But there, in the middle of the room, was Green, his hand on his side, which was leaking a lot of blood, and his eyes in a sort of haze. Blood dripped from his head to the deck planing below. Zenfor didn't think he would make it much longer. Status, Caspian ordered, as he motioned Zenfor over to Green. What was she supposed to do? She was no healer. We've lost primary and secondary engine control. All comms are offline, and we have four hull breaches. Decks 4, 7, 11, and 16, Uma said. The captain? I'm... Green said through gritted teeth. He was beside the specialist station when it exploded, Zal said, though the voice seemed to come from deep within him somewhere. He's badly injured. Sent for? Grab him and get him back to sickbay, Cass said. He needs treatment. What? I can't. Cass ran over. Yes, you can. It's up to you to save his life. You're faster and stronger than anyone else. Get him there. Get them to stop the bleeding. Senfor glanced down at the man. He had a strong will. He was still trying to sit up, even in his condition. She didn't want to be the reason he expired. She reached and put her arms under him, to which he grunted and winced in pain. But he kept from screaming. Listen to Caspian, Green said, his breath hitched. He knows. Go, Caspian yelled. And Zenfer returned to the hypervator, careful not to hit the captain on any of the door edges. She couldn't believe she was here, saving the human captain of a ship. What would her colleagues and family say if they could see her? The doors opened on level 14. It had been a smoother ride than it had up from the bay level. Senfor sprinted as fast as she could through the corridor, the doors and alcove she passed becoming a blur. She hadn't run at full speed since before leaving Sill Space, and it felt good to stretch out her muscles. She'd forgotten, without the constant stimulation of the suits, she needed to continue to physically exercise. Another drawback. As soon as she was inside sick bay, it was easy to tell something was wrong. Neither the ship's doctor nor the robot were in the room, though four other nurses were attempting to see to the patients who'd been brought in so far. All the beds were full. Captain, a nurse said, running up to them. His identifier said Menkel. Bring him over here, he said, directing Zenfor through the partition into the surgery wing of sickbay. Two of its beds were unoccupied. Where is the doctor? she asked. I think she's in engineering, Menkel said. She was headed down there with a small team before... He gestured at the chaos around him as he began to examine the captain. I need a full med unit in here. We're going into surgery. Zenfor backed off, allowing the medical personnel to do their work. Even she could tell the captain was in very bad shape, and she had little knowledge of human anatomy, other than what she'd read with Maless. For some reason, the doctor hadn't returned. Did that mean she was dead? Or had she been trapped in engineering? Perhaps that was where Zenfor could be of the most help, getting the engines back online. It was only four decks above her. That was where she needed to go next. She took one last look at the captain, then left the human healers to their jobs as she returned to the chaos of the corridors. Crew she'd never met ran past her in both directions, everyone trying to put out their own personal fires. Zenfor took off down the corridor behind a group of crewmen, each with tools and some with fire-suppressing equipment. They loaded into the nearest hypervator, and she got in behind them. Level 11, the lead one said. Level 10, Zenfor added. Are you going to engineering? One of the group asked her. Zenfor recognized her as Ensign Talia from the weapons bay down on 15. She nodded. Engineering is locked down. We got hit on 11, and it might have compromised the structural integrity of 10. We've got emergency force barriers in place holding everything together, but we won't know how bad it is until we see it. Is it something you need assistance with? Zenfor asked. Talia glanced at some of the other members of her group. The lead one nodded. Yeah, she said. That'd be great. Thanks. 33. Zal? How bad are the internal comms? Cass asked. The robotic skeleton didn't move, except for his hands. 
Cass realized the exoskeleton had eyes where human eyes should be, which made sense. But they were more like Box's sensors than actual eyes. Though instead of yellow, they glowed a faint red, which was not reassuring at all. We've lost our long-range antenna, which we would normally use for a backup, Saul said, his voice unchanged from when he had the hard light projection. And the internal comm hub was destroyed by one of the blasts. It will have to be manually reconnected with a new one. Fine, Cass said. Communications is on six? I'll print one and get started on it. Sir? Saul interrupted, causing Cass to stop short. The captain technically put you in charge. You should stay here and coordinate efforts. I can make the repairs. Cass furrowed his brow. No, he was done with the coalition. He'd tried the whole rank thing again, and it hadn't worked. In fact, it had done the opposite of worked. It had almost gotten everyone killed. He couldn't take command of the ship. Zal, I really think it's better you or Uma. I'm with the lieutenant, Uma said from tactical. You have more experience than any of us, and right now we need you. Cass glanced over to Ensign River, who had turned in her seat and was nodding along. This is crazy, Wolf said from behind him at the engineering station, to no one in particular. This ship is fucking crazy. Caspian has proven himself quite valuable in the past, Zal said. It is within his capability to do this task. Wolf huffed. Fine. Whatever. Orders, Captain? Damn. Zal was right. He didn't have time to weigh the pros and cons. Without Green or Evie, wherever the hell she was, the ship needed someone coordinating efforts to get it back on track. Especially before more of those fucking spheres decided to impact the hull. Zal? Go work on the comms. Lieutenant Uma? What's our tactical status? We've got force barriers covering each impact location, and they're holding. I can't be sure, but I think added reinforcements have been provided to main engineering, Uma said, as Zal left his station for the second hypervator on the bridge. The impact in 11? Cass asked. She nodded. Which meant people in engineering must know something they didn't. He was content to leave them to solve their problem until communications could be rectified. Sester knew what he was doing. What about our current weapons? Blades and darts are at 25%. I can give you a few hits if necessary. Armor is significantly weakened on the port side of the ship, but holding. All other sections are at 80%. Ensign River? Show me a shot off the starboard side of the ship, Cass said. An image appeared of open space, with the system's three stars in the background. The red and blue giants were immediately visible. And in the distance sat the third yellow star. And a bunch of bubbles of time no one can see, Cass thought. But at least he didn't see any of those spheres on that side of the ship. Assuming they were still out there and hadn't disappeared back to wherever Zenfor said they'd come from. Lieutenant, he said, indicating Uma, can you still connect with logs from the shuttles? There's a map in the Calypso's data banks that tells us where all these mines are. I need you to find and download it. Working on it, sir, she replied. Cass ran up to Rond, who was still splayed out over the helm station. He pulled the young man back, though he couldn't see any indication of injury. What happened to him? he asked River. I, I'm not sure. He might have hit his head. It happened when the third blast hit us. Cass put his fingers to the man's neck. He had a pulse. With some effort, Cass lifted the man out of the seat and laid him down in front of the stations, flat on his back. As soon as they got the comps back up, he'd call for medical. Until then, without knowing his injuries, there wasn't a lot they could do for him. Can you handle the helm? he asked River. Yes, I believe I can, she replied. I'm still trying. I mean, we're listing, and until the engines come back... Use whatever you've got. Emergency thrusters. Decompress a storage bay if you have to but we need to stop the ship from moving if we can. I don't want to attract any more of those things. He turned back to Uma. How's it coming? I think I've made a connection with the shuttle, but it's not solid. It could go at any second. Cass returned to the command chairs. Do the best you can. He glanced over at Wolf. What's the story on the engines? As best I can tell, that blast on Eleven knocked out the primary power conduits, which means engineering will need to reroute them before we can reignite the exodynes, to say nothing of using the undercurrent again. 
Both stared at her screens intently. I don't want to override what they might be doing down there. No, that's a good call. Let them handle the problems. We'll have to wait. Cass returned his attention to River. How's it going? I've managed to slow us, sir. Some of the emergency thrusters are still working. Only some? How bad is this? Not only were they in a potentially hostile system, but they had no backup, and the closest help would be two seasons away. The aliens had taken full advantage of Tempest being on her own and had lured them in. There was no other explanation for it. So what were they waiting for? I think I have the information from the Calypso, Uma said. I'm inputting the parameters now. On the main screen, a bright overlay in yellow showed the entire system, with faint outlines where the mine should be. But something was wrong. According to the map, there should be two just in front of us, but... They're not there anymore, Cass replied. I don't understand. Uma's face was distorted in confusion, and Cass couldn't blame her. He had difficulty grasping it himself. When we were in the shuttle, we found one of their ships, but it's sitting in a bubble of time, seconds behind us. There's a bunch of them out there we can't see. I'm betting these mines have the ability to phase in and out of that time stream at will, which is probably why we haven't had any more hits. But as soon as we move, they'll reactivate and come back into our own time stream. A different time stream? Wolf asked. What does that even mean? Cash shook his head. It was Zenforce theory, but I don't have any reason to doubt her. She knows technology like this better than we do, but I think it's how they hide from our sensors. Though something wasn't right. Ryan had told them they'd only been gone for a few seconds, when Cass knew it had been over twenty minutes, if for no other proof than the self-destruct timer on the Calypso had made it down to eight minutes by the time they got back. Did the shift explain time dilation? He couldn't be sure. It was far outside his realm of expertise. So what do we do? Wolf asked. We wait for engineering. Senfor stared at the open space beyond the sealed bulkhead. There was a small window that allowed them to see into the affected section, which had completely decompressed. We're going to have to go back for the enviro suits, the lead crewman said to the group. Obviously, we can't get anything done from here. Wait, Senfor said, glancing down at the repel field still affixed to her belt. I can go. What needs to be done? Those don't provide air, the crewman said, his tone condescending. I can hold my breath, Zenfor replied. It wouldn't be the most comfortable journey, but she could stand it for a short period of time at least. The Lee crewman looked exasperated. There's no gravity in there. You'll float off into space, he said. We have to go back for the suits. She can use this, Talia said, handing Zenfor a piece of equipment that was almost too small for her hand. It was nothing more than a handle affixed to a flat surface. It's a magnet clamp. We use it to wrench things open when they don't want to move. Tell me what you need me to do, Zenfor said, gripping the clamp. We think the energy conduits have been disrupted, Talia said, before anyone else could speak. Without them, the ship can't move. Yes, I'm familiar. Zenfor knew enough about the construction of a primitive ship such as this that she should be able to find a workaround without much problem. I'll take care of it. Leave this section. The lead crewman hesitated for a minute then indicated everyone else returned to the previous section of the deck. Talia hesitated a moment. Thanks for doing this, she said, and she placed her hand on Zenfor's shoulder, as far as it could reach anyway. Zenfor was momentarily reminded of Moles and how much she missed her, though at this moment it didn't seem so bad. Talia smiled and followed the rest of her crewmates back to the previous section, where they closed the emergency bulkhead. Their interested faces showed through the long window near the middle of the barrier. Zenfor activated the clamp and affixed it to the ground, bending down to brace herself against the force about to hit her. She took three deep breaths, then held the last one and touched the panel beside the bulkhead, separating her and the section open to space. A concussive force almost knocked her off her feet as the air was sucked from her section in less than a second, and she found herself exposed to the frigid cold of space. But the repel field was doing a decent job of keeping her body heat in, though there was no telling how long it could last. She disengaged the clamp and walked to the edge of the section where the gravity plating stopped, 
attaching the clamp to the inside of the next section's wall. She then pushed off and for a moment felt herself in full freefall until her grip tightened on the clamp and jerked her back. She scanned the half-destroyed room, looking for the primary power conduit control station. The back half of the room was open to space, and the floor was ripped away halfway down, exposing level 12 below her. But it seemed the force barriers were in place on 12 and had kept it from decompressing. If she could find additional power while she was in here, she'd try and get the force barriers up for 11 too. The ship wouldn't be able to make any faster than light travel without them anyway. Close to the middle of the room, and a tall tower that ran from what was left of the floor to the ceiling, was the control unit. The power conduits passed through there in order to be regulated. She'd need to bypass the entire unit if they had any chance of getting the engines running again. Zenfor reached out and grabbed a hunk of cabling along the wall and disengaged her clamp, using the cabling to move closer to the control unit. At least the section still had partial power. If it didn't, she'd have to reroute by hand, and she didn't think she could hold her breath for that long. Once she reached the top of the unit, she used the clamp on and off again to climb down it until she reached the controls. Many had been damaged, but she found a console that could still take commands. It took her a minute, but she managed to disengage the safety protocols and turn off the control unit, allowing the power to flow straight into engineering without interruption. But something wasn't right. The floor was still being blocked somehow. She glanced up at the ceiling itself and saw the explosion had caused some damage where the conduits must run. Using the clamp, she climbed her way back up, beginning to feel the effects of holding her breath for so long. It was odd how on a sill vessel none of this would be necessary. Yet here she was, the only one able to get a coalition vessel repaired. Holding on tight with one hand, Zenfor dug her fingers under one of the plates and ripped it away with sheer force, sending bolts and sharp edges of metal flying around in zero gravity with her. There was the problem. The conduit itself had been damaged. She wondered if she could shunt the energy through an adjoining system and then back into the conduits again, past the damaged section. It might blow out something else, but if they couldn't move, what good was the ship anyway? It would become nothing more than a floating coffin, just like those she'd seen at the funerals, drifting in space, alone forever. The thought sent a shudder down her back. So really, it wasn't a choice at all. She reached into the panel. Thirty-four. Commander, Ensign Tyler said, jumping up from his station, we've just regained main engine power. The conduits have been bypassed. Evie glanced up. How? I guess one of the repair crews got someone in the damaged sections down on eleven, he said, his voice full of elation. Commander, we have another problem. When they rerouted the power, it blew out life support on two decks, Crewman Alaksha said, her mouth clicking. And we have no way of notifying them, Evie putting words to what Alangsha hadn't said. Which decks? Ten and eleven. Evie folded her head in her hands. By Garth, when were they going to catch a break? We're going to have to open those doors, she said. Otherwise, we're all going to suffocate. Everyone is to get to Enviro suits as soon as they can, then return to your stations. That is... Assuming the deck doesn't decompress when we drop the reinforcement fields. She surveyed their faces one by one. Everyone seemed determined and ready. But the problem was Sester. He had a hard enough time moving through the corridors as it was, and it wasn't like he could exactly fit inside an Enviro suit. They'd have to get him off the deck. Commander? Station me near the door, Box said, coming up to her. If there's a structural failure, I won't be affected and might be able to contain it. He was right. He was the strongest person in the room, and he didn't need to breathe. Evie glanced at Zax, who indicated it was her show. Good idea. Notify me if you see any of the plates buckling near the door. Box nodded and trotted over to the giant rolling partition. Tyler, drop the fields. Tyler hesitated for a moment, then did as he was told. There was a sound of metal creaking through the room, but it was holding so far. Open the door, Evie said, bracing herself. 
She could see his hand shaking as it hovered over the control. He balled his hand into a fist, then extended his fingers again, tapping the control. The massive door began to roll away. Box stationed right at the opening. More creaking echoed through the room. Nothing yet, Box said as the door disappeared into the wall. Come on, everyone, get moving. You heard him, go. And notify everyone you pass, as well as every adjoining section, to evacuate, Evie said, praying everything held. It only had to be strong enough to get everyone out. Then it could do whatever it wanted. To his credit, Tyler began ushering out all the junior officers before him, making sure everyone was on their way before he even stood from his station. Evie indicated Zax to go. She'd be needed in sick bay if she wasn't already. And Zax nodded in wordless understanding, joining the ranks of engineers leaving through the door. He says he's willing to stay, Tyler said, looking up at Sester. The hell he is, Evie replied. She walked over and stood right in front of the Klaxian in his cradle. Let's go, Commander. You're not getting sucked into the deep reaches of space on my watch. He's afraid his size will cause the bulkheads to collapse, Tyler said. They won't, Evie replied, stubborn. After everything he'd done for her, she wasn't leaving Sester here. She turned to Tyler. You go on. Get into a suit so you can get back here. I'll deal with the commander here. Tyler glanced between them, then took off of the door, passing Box on his way out. She returned her attention to Sester. Look, if you stay here, you're going to die. You may not need eyes, but you still need to breathe. And in a few minutes, this entire deck is going to be uninhabitable without assistance. And we are not about to lose our best engineer. And before you think it, yes, you're better than Cass or Zenfor or anyone else. You're probably the smartest person on this ship, which means you already know I'm right. You told me not to let the fear overwhelm me. I'm telling you the same thing. Now, let's go. Sester raised two of his arms out of the cradle, along with his head arm, and extricated himself from the device. She reflected on how human he'd appeared in her head. For some reason, that was the image she'd thought of when she saw him. Sester crouched down, elongating his limbs so he moved across the floor slowly and methodically, distributing his weight evenly. Evie kept ahead of him, approaching Box. Status? It's holding so far, he replied, but, um, well, I guess we'll just find out what happens, he said, his voice suddenly cheery as Sester approached. If we get sucked out into space, I'll do everything I can to throw you back in the direction of the ship. That's reassuring. Thanks, Evie replied. You're most welcome. It's times like these when I wish Cass would have taken me up on my suggestion of adding a jet backpack to my superstructure. I always told him it would come in handy one day, and he just brushed me off like always, telling me to stop being a nuisance. Well, I can't wait. Box, Evie said, not now. Right. Sester approached them and the creaking of the plates increased, causing him to slow. Oh no, don't stop now. Let's move, Commander, Evie said, moving out of the way. Sester continued forward, passing the massive door and box slower than Evie thought he needed to. But then again, Claxians weren't used to things like this. They were pacifists by nature, which meant they weren't often in harm's way. She reflected just how much courage it was taking Sester to do this. Once he was in the corridor, he folded himself tighter and moved faster, using his limbs to grab onto the sides of the corridors to propel him forward quicker. That's it. He's clear, Evie said, leaving engineering. Box followed and tapped the panel beside the door, closing it again. There was a final creak and moan from the bulkheads, and for a second Evie thought that was it, but they held as the door closed. Good work, she said. Now... Let's get up to the bridge. The corridors were chaos. True to her orders, the engineering crew had gone to personally notify everyone on the deck to evacuate or find an Enviro suit if they needed to stay. Since Enviro suits were limited, most had opted to leave and were in the process of crowding the hypervators or using the access ports. Evie had helped direct Sester to a hypervator that could take him to one of the cargo holds on four 
where he would be able to stretch out and could access secondary controls. As she and Box ran around people, she had to move a scythe as a maintenance crew already decked out in enviro suits pushed their way past. Evie recognized them as a structural crew. Tyler must have already notified them to get back to engineering and shore up the weak bulkheads. If they made it through this, she would make sure he received a promotion. Evie and Box had taken refuge in an abandoned adjacent corridor while the maintenance crew ran past. And had Evie not glanced behind her before they left, she wouldn't have seen the figure slumped against the wall near the end of the corridor. Box, she yelled, indicating the person, help me. She jogged up to the figure, but stopped short when she saw the cropped black haircut and immediately recognized her. Who? Oh, Box said, moving around her, gingerly lifting Laura up. Lieutenant, can you hear me? He tapped the sides of her cheeks. Is she dead? Evie asked, the bottom dropping out of her stomach like she'd been kicked. No, she has a pulse, but it's weak. I believe she sustained a head injury, Box said, inspecting Laura's scalp. I don't know what the damage is, though. I'll need to get her to sickbay. Evie bent down and cupped Laura's face with her hand. She hadn't told her, but her presence in sickbay when Evie was having her visions was nothing short of miraculous. From the moment she'd come in, Evie had felt more at ease, more like herself than she had in a long time. Just having her there by her side was comforting, and she'd never had the opportunity to tell Laura. I'm so sorry, Evie said as she leaned in and placed a light kiss on Laura's cheek. Box will take good care of you. She looked up at him. Can you move her? Are you kidding? Humans are light. You've seen me carry more than one at a time, Box said. Gently, I mean, so it won't aggravate her injury. Oh, of course. Box placed his arms underneath Laura, supporting her back and legs, and lifted her up, making sure her head didn't fall back as he did. I know I'm not supposed to be studying you, he said, but I think your odds of sustaining a relationship are better than I'd first anticipated. Just get her there safely, okay? Evie said, concerned coloring her words. Laura had always been there, and now that she might not be, it filled Evie with dread, and regret she had taken her for granted all this time. That stopped today. You can count on me, Commander, Box said. I'll make sure she's well taken care of. He took off back down the corridor, Evie could tell he'd engage his own personal dampening system, as Laura didn't bounce or move at all as he ran. He turned the corner and was out of sight in the throng of people. Evie swallowed hard and returned to the main hallway. Getting a hypervader would take forever, and the bridge was only two decks above her. She was better off taking the access corridors. She pushed her way through the people, trying to keep everyone calm and collected, but urging them to exit areas on this level. She needed this chaos. It was the only thing that would keep her mind off Laura, and if Box had made it to sickbay yet. She reached one of the access hatches to the maintenance tunnels and climbed inside, directing a group from one of the science wings to follow her. They'd been standing in the middle of the corridor, looking lost. Keep up, Evie said. As soon as we're clear to nine, you can return to the main areas. It was much quieter in here than it had been out on the floor, where she'd just been. Only the hum of the ship and a few errant sounds, probably from maintenance crews working to reinforce the ship. She could only hope the bridge was still intact. One of the explosions had happened at Deck 7, which was too close to the bridge for her taste, despite the fact it was fortified in the middle of the ship. That hadn't stopped Blackburn from being killed, and it didn't mean they were free of harm either. Most of the main systems converged on the bridge, which meant there was a lot of power running through that section of the ship. If any of those conduits was ruptured... She shook her head, trying not to think about it. But instead, an image of the gray alien came back to her from her journey with Sester. She didn't know who he was or what he was meant to represent, but she had no problem mentally blocking him anymore. He tried to lunge for her as she climbed, but was knocked away with a force ten times his own, can't get me any more, fucker, she smiled. There would be time later to figure out what it all meant. For now, she had to find the captain and help get the ship back under control. It was the only way they were going to get out of this mess.
35. Sir, I've managed to connect the new comm hub down on deck 6, Zal said, but I had to come back through the maintenance hatches. For some reason, the hypervators are all held up. Perfect, Cass said, not attempting to mask the sarcasm in his voice. He'd added to the things to deal with later. How long until we have comms? Ten more minutes. I have to reset and reprogram the system. Cass sat back in the captain's chair, wiping his brow. Ten minutes until they knew what was happening in engineering. Wait, Wolf said. We've got partial power. Whatever they're doing down there, it's working. We've got enough for the primary engines and to open an undercurrent. Cass turned to Uma. What's the status of the hull breaches? They wouldn't be going anywhere if any part of the ship was open to space. Not unless he wanted the gravity shear created by the undercurrent to rip the ship in two. Emergency force barriers are holding on, all except for Eleven. It's opened back up to space. Any change in the status of the mines? She shook her head. He had an idea. Maybe these mines weren't automated after all. Maybe someone was controlling them and just waiting for signs of life from Tempest before launching any more. Focus your attention on the area where the Calypso was patrolling. Do you see two small moons? Yes, orbiting that small planet. Right. That's where the arch is. Scan that area for any other ships. Would the ship they boarded show itself? Or was he wrong, and it was abandoned? Not picking up anything, sir, she said. Okay, try... Cass turned to see the maintenance hatches all had come from, open, and Evie crawl out, her hair a mess and covered in dust. Report, she said, standing and dusting herself off. Evie? Cass asked. Are you... She glanced at him with fire in her eyes. This was not the same woman they'd taken away on a gurney. This was a woman determined, and with a fight back in her. Whatever she'd been through was clearly no longer affecting her. Cass caught Evie glance at Wolf, then surveyed the bridge. I'm fine, she replied. What's our status? Where's the captain? If she was surprised to see him in command, she didn't show it. The captain was critically injured in the attack. Zal almost has the comms back up, and we have partial power to the engines. Currently, there aren't any more mines out there, but I believe they're hidden and will activate if we try to move the ship. So it was mines, Evie said, though it was more to herself than anyone else. Where's the captain now? Senfor took him to sickbay after we got back. Evie, we found the arch. You were right. It held a bubble of time out of sync with our own, and there was a ship. She zeroed her attention on him. What kind of ship? I think it might be one that Starbase 5 saw, but I haven't confirmed that yet. As soon as we came back through, the mines exploded. We also lost another shuttle out there before we recalled them all, he said. We managed to download a map of the mines, but they've disappeared off our scanners again. Okay, Evie said, surveying the bridge. I'm taking over the helm, and I'm getting us the hell out of here before we get hit with any more of these things. But, Cass said, lowering his voice, how do we know we won't hit any more if we can't see them? They might have moved. Because I've got a map too, she said, pointing to her head. She walked over and took the helm position beside Enton River. Wait a second, Wolf said. You're not going to just let her take control of the ship. She's been having hallucinations. She left her station and turned to Evie. No offense, Commander, but you haven't been in the best mental state since we took the shuttle out. Trust me, Evie said. I remember. How do we know she isn't going to see something and run us right into one of those mines out there? Wolf said. Cash shrugged, happy to have someone on the bridge who could take over. She was right about the arch. Plus, she's the ranking officer now. It's her call. Not if she's mentally incapacitated, Wolf said. Technically, you shouldn't even be up here. And now we're supposed to hand over control of the ship to her? Commander? If you can't work under these conditions, I'll relieve you of duty, Cass said, standing firm. You can't do that, she replied. I can, Evie said, turning in her chair, and he's right. Either return to your station or leave the bridge. Wolf seemed to consider it for a minute. She glanced at Cass, then Evie again, and shook her head, returning to her station. I can't believe this, she said. 
Is this how the Coalition's most advanced ship runs? No wonder you lost your last engineer. Cass felt the floor drop out from under him. As if they were moving on their own, his feet propelled him toward Wolf, intent on decking her. But before he reached her, another voice rang out, stopping him in his tracks. Don't you have any respect? Commander Bloom was an excellent officer and volunteered to go on her mission. She sacrificed herself for the good of the ship and its crew. Cass turned to see Ensign River standing, staring at Wolf, her eyes blazing. Both Zal and Uma were looking at the bridge engineer as well. In any other situation, calling out a superior officer like that could lead to some serious consequences, especially while on duty. Wolf's face stiffened. I'm... I'm sorry. I didn't... I meant no disrespect. I'm just frustrated. I suggest you bottle that frustration until we are clear of this threat, Commander, Evie said. She was the only one who hadn't turned around. Instead, she was programming something at Ron's helm station. Yes, ma'am, Wolf replied, taking her seat in engineering. Everyone else returned to their positions as well. Cass had to admit he was impressed with Ensign River. She normally seemed so timid and reserved. It turned out Blum had a lot more support than he'd ever realized. We've got comms back, uh, ma'am, sir, Saul said, unsure who to direct the news to. Commander, I'm relinquishing control of the bridge to you, Cass said. He should have done it as soon as she'd come out of the bridge, but he'd been so stunned to see her it had slipped his mind. Stay where you are, Evie said. I'll have my hands full doing this, and we may need someone to coordinate. Was this a test? The last time he'd been in a position of authority, it hadn't gone too well between them. Are you sure? She turned in her chair again. Cass, don't argue. I promise I'll relieve you once all this is over, but I can't do it by myself, okay? No games, no hidden agendas. He nodded. Okay. Great. She turned back to the front and continued inputting her information. Cass hit the comm button on the side of the command chair. Engineering, this is the bridge. Report status. Tyler here, sir. We've lost life support on this deck, but we have enough power to move. Commander Sester is up on four, coordinating with us down here. We're trying to help reinforce the hull breach on deck 11. The sill almost asphyxiated getting us back online. I had some people take her to sickbay. Wait, Zentor was down there? Cass asked. Yes, sir. If it weren't for her, we wouldn't have power. Evie turned and gave him a look of surprise that he was sure mirrored his own face. Get Eleven sealed up as soon as you can. We may need to use the undercurrent drive if things get hairy up here. Acknowledged. Working on it now. Tied her out. Cass tapped the comm again. Robota sickbay. Status report. This is Mankel one of the nurses answered. Dr. Zax is currently in surgery with the captain. His injuries were severe, and she isn't sure of his prognosis. We have 47 injured, but only six critically, and we're tending to them as fast as we can. Is Consul Zenfor down there? Cass asked. She's being treated. It seems she might have strained her oxygen capacity, Mankel said, but we expect her to be okay. What about Lieutenant Yamashita? Evie asked. Cass perked up, glancing over to her. Box is caring for her now, Commander. We expect her to make a full recovery as well. Cass saw Evie visibly exhale and returned her attention to her station. Thanks, Minkle. Keep us updated on the captain's condition. Cass cut the comm. He turned to Uma. Using our map, I need you to keep a target on where those mines were last. If we need to blow one before we get to it, we will but we don't want to cause a cascade reaction. There are thousands of those things out there. Uma nodded. Cass couldn't believe how natural all this felt. It really was like slipping on an old pair of shoes. So why had it been so hard last time? Was it because he'd put so much pressure on himself to perform? To be the perfect officer? Or was it everyone else's expectations? Whatever the reason, he was here now and the crew needed his help to get them out of the snare. And he was going to do everything in his power to make it happen. 
The show is all yours, Commander, Cass said, nodding to Evie. She took a deep breath. Here we go. Thirty-six. Okay, Evie. Okay, you can do this. She tried focusing on the images in her mind. The one she'd seen of the system itself, with all the tiny black orbs. She could see Omicron and Terminus, out in the distance, and the third, smaller yellow star, a distant point, just as it appeared on the screens before she'd closed her eyes. Visualizing the field, the sphere stood out in her mind. It was a little hazy, but she was reasonably sure she could get them through this. "'What is she doing?' she heard Wolf whisper to Cass. But he didn't even acknowledge her. Or at least it didn't sound like he did. She couldn't blame Wolf for being nervous. Last time she'd been in this position, Evie had almost killed the engineer. But she had a handle on it now. She was going to get them through this. Evie opened her eyes and glanced over at Ensign River, who was watching her with great interest. "'Natalia, I'm going to need your help here,' she said. "'Keep an eye on my plotting. Don't let me drift, and watch the back end of the ship. It can't be swinging all over the place. This has to be precise.' "'Got it, Commander,' she replied, her mechanical hands on the controls. Evie had never looked in the ensign's file to see what had happened to cause her to lose her original hands. But she would after this. No, she'd go a step further and talk to the ensign about it. The time for keeping herself cut off from everyone around her was over. She would make more of an effort to get to know the people she worked with. She wasn't going to remain distant anymore. Volv, you ready?' she asked. Sixty percent power and holding,' the lieutenant commander replied. "'Once we're free, we should be able to make an undercurrent.' "'Assuming Deck Eleven is sealed by then,' Cass said. "'Tyler reports they're close,' Zal added. "'All decks have reported in and are ready, Commander. "'The bays have also reported all shuttles and space wings have returned to the hangars.' "'Evie closed her eyes one more time, confirming she saw what she thought she saw, and opened them again. "'Uma?' Give me the overlay of the map you have. The yellow overlay displayed on the screen in front of them, fuzzy yellow dots representing where the spheres were supposed to be. But it didn't quite match what Evie was seeing in her head. No matter. She'd use both and avoid the areas entirely, even if they weren't exactly lined up. She only hoped her memory was as solid as she thought it was. She engaged the main Exodyne engines, and the ship crept forward. All sections are holding. Zal said. She'd feared the ship might wrench itself apart just by moving, but thankfully the gravitational forces were minor in this part of the system. They were too far from any of the stars for shearing to be a real concern. Adjusting heading, Natalia watched the drift, she said. Out of the corner of her eye, River nodded, and Evie plotted the ship around the first location of mines. That's one, she said. Commander, I'm getting some strange readings, Uma said. Evie glanced behind her to see Cass join Uma at her station. The ship! God damn it! I knew it wasn't abandoned, Cass said. What's happening? Evie asked, trying to keep her attention on the task ahead of her. She needed to maneuver around two more. That ship is coming through the arch, Cass said, into our time. Suddenly, one of the orbs appeared right before them. Whoa, Evie said, adjusting their heading as fast as she could. This is going to be close. Commander, she heard Uma say. Prepare to fire all weapons, Cass replied. Lock on that ship, but don't take the shot yet. Aye, sir, she replied. Evie held her controls down, even though she knew it would do no good. The image on the screen in front of them tilted at an angle as the orb disappeared below the screen. She could only hope they had enough clearance to miss it. That one hadn't been on the map, nor had it been in her mind. It seemed her memory wasn't as reliable as she'd hoped. This might be a rougher ride than I thought, she said. It missed the hull by seven meters, Zal said. At least we know they're not magnetic, Cass replied, relief in his voice. He was right. If they were, this would be a lot harder, and they'd be much less likely to get out of it alive. Commander, Zal said, though there was a tinge of stress in his voice she never heard before. The mine is following us. It seemed to have some kind of propulsion I can't discern. "'Where's the ship?' Cass asked. "'It's leaving the archway now, headed for us,' Uma said. Four minutes to intercept.' 
I don't guess there's any chance of them running into the mines, is there? Evie asked. I think they're the ones controlling them, Cass replied. This whole thing was nothing but a lure, probably to ascertain our defenses. Shit, Evie said, as another mine appeared in front of them. She had to program a new heading fast. I've got you, Commander, Anson Rivers said, her hands flying over the controls. It wasn't the same vector Evie would have programmed, but it was enough to get them out of the way of the mine. It disappeared around the edge of the screen. Four meters, Saul said. Nicely done, Evie said, smiling at the ensign, who smirked back. She readjusted the heading and turned for what she hoped was an open section in the maze. If they couldn't cut on the maps, they'd be flying blind, which meant she'd have to slow down if they didn't want to accidentally run into one of these things. And she wasn't keen to find out what happened when that ship finally caught up with them. Evie, I know you know this, but we need to pick up the speed, Cass said. She shook her head. There was just no way. Where are our defensive barriers? Eighty percent still, Uma said, except for the sections that are open to space. Those are down to ten. Any hits there could end up crippling us. What is the explosive? Fuck! Another mine had just appeared in front of them, and Evie forced Tempest down below it, straight down the Z-plane. She'd stay on this trajectory until they had to change again. Two of the mines are now trailing us, Commander, but they don't seem to be catching up, Saul reported. Evie took a breath. She was going to get them out of this, no matter what. What is the explosive yield of one of those mines? She finished. Roughly 50,000 terajoules, Uma replied. 50,000. The hull could take a couple of those with the defensive barriers up and still come out okay. But they'd have to be strategic. She couldn't let them hit the upper levels. Those weren't as reinforced as some of the lower sections. And the engines were out of the question. But if she could move the ship in the right direction and maneuver it right... Two minutes to intercept, Saul said. Evie, I say we blow those two tailing us and then try to get out as fast as we can, Cass said. If it causes a cascade explosion, we might not be able to outrun it, she replied. Plus, we don't know how many more are left out there. I thought you had the map. It's inaccurate, she replied. Great, just great, Wolf said from her station. We're all going to die out here. Can it, Cass said. Evie, do the best you can. But we can't let that ship reach us. You and I both know nothing good will come of that. He was right. Whatever the ship was, whatever it wanted, it was not likely to be friendly. If it were her on that ship, she'd want to catch Tempest while it was still active, while it still had people working on it, so she could learn as much as she could about them, especially if she was about to invade their territory. By coming here, they'd handed the aliens a gift on a platter, and she was going to make damn sure they didn't get to feast, even if it required extreme measures. She took a deep breath and increased power to the engines. There's no way we're going to make this, Wolf muttered. Evie did her best not to pay her any attention, but it was hard to keep that negative voice under wraps. And all of a sudden, she was back in her father's house again, staring at his back as he worked. No, I've beat this, she said. I'm done with you. Done. You can't get rid of me just like that, her father said, his back still to her. You don't just get to walk away, Evelyn. He turned around in his chair, and Evie recoiled. It was her father, and yet not. It was as if her brain couldn't decide whether it was seeing the alien or the man who had raised her. But both spoke the same words in the same gravelly voice. You can't be like the rest of them. You've always kept your distance because it was a smart thing to do. It was the way you kept yourself safe. If nothing else, I taught you that. All you taught me was to be afraid of forming any real bonds with people, she yelled. That getting close was something to fear. I finally have people in my life who want to get to know me, and I'm not turning my back on them. She thought of Laura down in sickbay, and how she'd stayed by Evie's side when she needed someone there. And Cass, who despite everything they'd been through, had ended up believing her in the end, and finding the archway. Even after all her best efforts, people had found their way into her life and they were much too precious to let go. You only think they want to get to know you, but they're really only out for themselves, as everyone is. Be careful what you wish for. They may not be so friendly once they find out who's beneath the surface. His mouth, mouths, 
curled into an ugly grin. And Evie couldn't believe this had been the man she'd spent every day of her childhood with. But this wasn't him. This was only what her mind was conjuring. None of it was real. Oh, it's real, all right, he replied, startling her. He held out one hand, which was simultaneously human and not. In it was a small orb covered in cuts and striations. Some of the cuts were deep enough if you could see a glowing red core beneath. The orb turned in his hand on its own. At first she was confused, but the longer she stared at the orb, the more she realized she'd seen it before, only she couldn't remember where. It doesn't matter, Evie said, looking him in the eye, eyes. I'm done listening to you, and you can rot in the ground for all I care. That chapter of my life is over. Her father's face fell, and so did his arm, the orb shattering on the ground as it hit. Evie snapped back. 37. What the hell is happening? Wolf yelled. Cass stood, watching Evie at the helm. It seemed she had gone into a trance. Ensign River, take over, he yelled, running over to Evie. He shook her by the shoulder. Hey, Evie! Her eyes were still wide open, but she wasn't focused on anything. I told you, I knew this was going to happen, Wolf said. Cass tapped Evie's cheeks, hoping to bring her out of it. The last thing they needed was to lose what little advantage they had. Sir, the alien ship is one minute from intercepting, and those mines are still behind us, Saul said. Cass turned to River. Can you get us out of here? Grief and terror colored her face. I'll, I'll do my best, sir. River set her face and began plotting a new course. Lieutenant, prepare to fire on those mines, Cass said. Uma nodded in response. Cass tapped the back of his hand. Rabo to medical. We have an emergency on the bridge. Send... Wait. Evie jerked in her seat and out of Cass's grasp. Those aren't the right coordinates. It wasn't an accusation to River, more like a revelation. Here, I've got it now, she said, working hard on the console to input a new heading. What happened? Cass asked. What's going on? I can see it again, Evie said. The map of the mines. I've got it in my mind, and it's clear. She turned to him. They're moving, Cass. The aliens are moving them at will, trying to slow us down until their ship can reach us. How do you know they're moving? He asked. Because I can see the real-time map of them, right now, she said. Her voice was light, practically giddy. And now they can't stop us. Wolf, I'm going to need everything you've got. Cass watched as she shunted all the power to the Exodyne engines, and the ship lurched forward, plowing through the system. Evie made what seemed like random adjustments on the fly, sending them this way and that. Oh, I think they're getting frustrated, she said, a smile in her voice. They're activating all the mines. She's right, Zal said. I'm now reading 122,000 mines, all converging on our location. Don't worry. Evie replied, just as Cass's heart rate picked up. They won't be able to catch us. The ship dived down, then back up. Woohoo! This is fun! Isn't this fun? she asked, turning to him. He was a little more than disturbed at her lack of seriousness. But as long as they were missing the mines... The alien ship is working to keep up with us, but is falling behind, Zal said. The bastards thought they had us, Evie said. They might have even given you false hopes with that map you picked up. But they never saw me coming. You think our map was deliberately wrong? Cass asked. I think it was meant to make you think you had a method of escape. Then, when we tried, we'd be disabled, and they could take their time with us. But that's not happening now. The ship pulled into a roll, and Cass was reminded of when Evie had been in control of the reasonable excuse. She'd used some of the same moves, though the ship had been much smaller. How are we coming on those hull breaches? she asked. All teams are reporting the sections have been reinforced, Zal said. Though if they're looking outside, they may be a touch space sick. They'll get over it, Evie replied. She glanced up to Cass. You might want to get back to your seat while you've still got it, she winked. He couldn't help but be impressed. She was in complete control, and she knew it. Cass returned to the captain's chair. She was right. It would probably be the last time he'd ever get to sit in it. He'd managed to become a starship captain after all. 
even if only for a short time. We're almost clear, she said. Only a few more. The ship jerked wildly back and forth, and Cass watched River work to keep up with Evie's moves, keeping the whole ship on its line. That's it. The field is behind us. The two mines are still 50,000 kilometers astern, Saul said. Evie turned in her seat. You know what to do. Cass nodded. Lieutenant Uma, destroy those two mines. Ensign, plot us a course out of here. Commander, make sure we don't blow up. Firing now, Uma said. The image on the screen flipped to the rear view, and for a brief second, Cass missed the old 3D center display. Course laid in, River replied. Behind them, the blades detonated on the mines, creating a massive explosion. Evie had been right. All of the other mines had been in pursuit as well. The alien ship was caught up in the destruction. Helm, get us the hell out of here, Cass ordered. Evie punched it, and the undercurrent opened ahead of them. Cass watched as the remnants of the explosion continued to ripple through the system. There was no telling if it would permeate the temporal barrier to the bubbles, but there was a good chance everything on this side, save the heavenly bodies, would be destroyed. Evie slumped back in the helm's chair as the undercurrent rippled on the screen ahead of them. Cass took a breather as well, visually checking all the members of the bridge crew. It was impossible to tell what Zal was feeling, as his exoskeleton remained rigid and unmoving from its position. Uma seemed shaken, but gave him a nod of approval. He glanced back at Wolf, who had a sheepish look on her face under all that pink hair. She mouthed, Good job, and he took it in stride. In reality, he'd done very little. It was Evie who'd saved them. If not for her, that alien ship would probably be taking them apart piece by piece right now. Cass stood from his chair. Commander? Evie turned, her eyes full of... What was that? Joy? He indicated the chair beside him. She stood as well, approaching him. Mr. Rabot, I formally relieve you. He stepped aside. I stand relieved. He put out his hand and she shook it, giving it a firm shake. Cass stepped back, allowing her to take the captain's chair. Hanson, keep us on this heading until we return to Coalition Space. We're going to have a lot to tell the people back home. Ah, uh, Commander, Volf said. Cass and Evie turned to her in unison. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I don't think we're making it back to Coalition Space. Why not? Evie asked. Because I'm getting updated reports from engineering. Tyler says the sill improvements to the engines are offline. And without them, and Sister out of engineering, we're stuck at standard speed. Thirty-eight. So, here are our options, none of which are ideal, Evie said, pointing to the hollow screen of the desk in the command room. She had called Cass in there after Volt's revelation they wouldn't be able to get back to Coalition Space in the same amount of time it took them to get out here. It was hard to imagine. Five days here, but nearly two hundred back. They didn't have that kind of time. They'd have to find a place where they could catch their breaths, make some repairs, find some resources. The only problem was much of the space out here wasn't charted. All they had was astrometric data from sensor telescopes and what limited scans they'd been able to make so far. They were stuck out here, alone, and without any system of support. She could only hope the aliens had been destroyed in the explosion, and more weren't on their trail. This is it? Cass asked, staring at the options before them. There's nothing else? Nothing close. Until we get Sester back in engineering, and Deck 10 up and running again, we're stuck with normal undercurrent travel. Which means this ship has a limited travel distance of five light years per day. That's it. And we just don't have any idea what's out here. Any system we enter could be inhabited or not. We might run into the aliens, or a species we've never even heard of. But the fact is, we need raw materials if we're going to repair the ship, and that means we need to refine Cyclax and Galvanium. This is all we've picked up so far. Cass stared at the three systems on the screen, and she knew what must be running through his head. 
Each one was worse than the last. She'd had Zal draw up info on the closest three systems, but it didn't look as though any had habitable planets, at least not habitable in the traditional sense. This one. Why are we calling this option A? It's got a Class A star with four planets, all so close they're basically molten. We couldn't even send down ships to gather materials. She shook her head. I know. But initial scans reveal the planets are rich in base elements. It would be a job, but we'd have to siphon off the materials and cool them before we could use them in any way. And this one, option B, is full of gas giants and two small planetoids, one dead and one covered in glacial ice, with oceans a thousand kilometers deep? I know, she said. He wasn't telling her anything new. He was just venting. Better to let him get it out all at once, then they could move on. Oh, option C. I love this one. One planet with possible value, except its surface temperature is over 500 Kelvin, and the atmosphere is nothing but toxic gas. I actually think that's our best option, Evie said. Cass ran a hand on his face. Why can't this area of space have any Cypaxias? She cringed at the word, but let it roll off her shoulders. There probably were more habitable worlds somewhere in the vicinity. But without a survey ship or more advanced equipment, Tempest was unlikely to find them. She was built for stealth, not exploration. And despite all the talk of recent expansion by Coalition Central, they'd made few inroads to actually expanding their territory. It was amazing how difficult it was to maintain and patrol a large area of space. Okay, say we go with C. How are we supposed to extract anything? Enviro suits can't handle that kind of punishment. If you have a better idea, I'm happy to listen, she said. Cass slumped down into one of the chairs while she took a seat on the other side. Things looked a lot different from over here. She hoped the captain would be up again soon though they still hadn't had word from sickbay. When the team had come to retrieve Rond, Evie had asked if they had any update, but with so many people in sickbay, it had been too chaotic. They'd promised Zax would contact her as soon as she was out. I don't, Cass finally replied. Though we might want to go back to Omicron Terminus before too long. If any part of that ship survived, it could be valuable. Or it could be another lure. I'm not about to give them the second chance to get their hands on us. What you learned while you were in the ship will have to suffice for now. Unless the captain orders different. As soon as Zenfor is back on her feet, I know she'll want to take a look at it. We're going to need her back in engineering, too. I don't plan on being stuck out here for another half year while we limp our way back to the Coalition. Regaining full undercurrent power is our first priority, while the long-range antennas should be our second. I don't think we could stay out here that long if we wanted, Cass replied. We don't have the supplies for that, do we? She shook her head. They loaded up on Cypaxia, but even then it wasn't more than two seasons worth. What should have been more than enough? We may have to start rationing, until we're sure we can get things back up and running. Cass smirked. That's why I'm glad I'm not in command anymore. That's going to be a fun announcement. You're an ass, she said, returning the smile. You did pretty good out there today. Thanks for being there. He nodded, a satisfied look falling on his face as he took a relaxed breath. And thanks for believing me. It, it wasn't easy. He leaned forward. Is everything okay now? Are you okay? I don't know. Something happened down in engineering... I saw a series of images, including Omicron Terminus. And, come to think of it, a habitable planet. But it's getting fuzzy again. It was full of those aliens. And you think those are the aliens Starbase 5 picked up? The ones that set the mines and were on that ship? She hesitated. I think so. Though I don't know. But somehow, when Dad attacked me, something happened. And I don't know how to explain it but I've got better control over it now. I can make the visions go away. Evie took a long breath, glancing around the room. 
And hopefully, now I can get some sleep. We all could use some of that. As soon as Sester has the engines back up and running, I'm going to spend more time with him. He helped me to get control of it. Now if I can only figure out what it all means. He gave her a kind smile, one she'd rarely seen on him. I'm here to help in any way I can. Thanks, she replied. I'm going to need all I can get. The call had come in not long after they'd left the command room, and Evie had ordered Ensign River to adjust their heading for option C, the one with the death planet. Evie had left Wolf in charge, and they'd taken the hypervader down to sick bay on 14. What's the status? Evie ordered as soon as they were through the door. Cass hadn't realized when the medical team said sick bay was full, they hadn't been kidding. All the beds were occupied, and the nurses had made makeshift stations on the floor, wherever they could put a person. People were up against the walls, holding their own regenerators, as the nurses worked on the more critical cases. Cass didn't even see Box. He must be in the other part of sick bay, or in surgery with Zax. They just came out, Nurse Mankel said, coming up to them. In the back. Evie pushed through the crew as best she could, checking on each of them as she did. Cass had to admit, something had changed in her. Whether it held or not was yet to be seen, but he'd never seen her as open about her concerns for the crew as she was making her way through sickbay. A blur moved through the crowd, straight for her, catching them both off guard, before it plowed into Evie, grabbing hold of her. Cass stepped back as he realized it was Lieutenant Yamashita who had wrapped Evie in a hug. A tingling sensation crept up the back of his neck and across his face, knowing he was watching something private. Both of them were trembling slightly as they held each other. He glanced around and caught sight of Zenfor off to the side, standing as stoic as always. The only difference was she was hooked up to what looked like a portable oxygen machine, with a small tube running down to a larger machine beside the wall. He silently excused himself, hoping to give them a modicum of privacy, and went over to check on Zenfor. Everything okay? he asked. She nodded, saying something, though her voice was muffled. What? She lifted the mask from her face. I'm fine, but the doctor insists I wear this for the next ten hours to make sure there isn't permanent damage. She doesn't believe me when I tell her sill lungs are resilient. The mask came back down. Cass grinned, seeing in his peripheral Evie and the lieutenant had separated, yet still held each other's hands. He returned his attention to Zenfor. They tell me you're responsible for getting the engines back online and saving the ship. Zenfor only shrugged. As soon as Ten is repressurized, they're going to need you down there. Your engine modifications are offline. Her brows formed into a V, prompting concern from Cass. She nodded, though the look didn't leave her face. What? Is something wrong? he asked. She lifted the mask again. No. I'll check the system as soon as I can. She hesitated in bringing the mask back down. The aliens were testing us, you understand. he came to the same conclusion himself. Fortunately, we made it out, thanks to Evie's. He didn't want to say ability. It wasn't his to reveal to the crew if that was what she wanted to do. Insight. Next time we might not be so lucky. Which is why we need those engines back. So we're not at their mercy. Cass? Evie called from across the room, indicating he followed her into the back. Yamashita had either left or retreated to some part of sick bay he could no longer see. I'll catch up with you later. Evie wants us to study all the data we brought back from the alien ship. Zenfor nodded, a smirk playing on her lips under the transparent mask. What? She shook her head and indicated he follow Evie. Whatever she found humorous, he'd have to ask her later. But he couldn't help wondering if it had to do with the fact he'd been ready to leave the ship not so long ago, and now nothing could be further from his mind. Cass made his way through the rest of the patients, reaching the back, which was partitioned off, Green lay on one of the beds near the back, while two others of the crew were being prepped for surgery. Zax and Box stood beside Evie, Zax looking grim and sullen, while Box watched with impassivity. "'What's going on?' Cass asked. 
The captain is out of surgery. We were able to save his life, but he may have irreparable brain damage, Zack said, her face solemn. He's in an artificial coma right now, and I'm not confident we should wake him. It could do further damage. What does that mean? What are you going to do? Cass asked. Keep him under, Box said, his tone fully serious, until we get back to a starbase. I was just explaining to them our situation, Evie said, and how we may be here a while. Zax turned to her. We can keep him under as long as we need to. I can even put him in stasis if it comes to that. But, Commander, it's your ship now. I know the captain would have full confidence in your ability to lead this crew. Evie took a deep breath and ran her hand down her messed up ponytail, flipping it over her shoulder. Right. She glanced at Cass. Does Zenfor think she can fix the drive? She seemed to think so, yeah, Cass replied. Evie nodded. Good. Anything else to report? I received the final casualty report. We lost 29 in all when those mines hit. All took decompression. Evie's eyes twitched, but otherwise she remained stoic. Understood. We've only got one other critical... Everyone else's injuries are mild, just bumps and bruises mostly, like Lieutenant Yamashita. We should have everyone clear in a few more hours. Their new captain seemed satisfied. Notify me if anything changes about Green's condition. For the time being, we'll leave this in your capable hands and sort out the rest. She turned to Cass. Come with me. She indicated they leave sickbay together. Congratulations on your promotion, Box called. Cass rolled his eyes. It was just like him to be inappropriate at a time like this. Zax needed to redouble her efforts on his bedside manner. When he and Evie got out into the corridor beyond sickbay, she leaned up against the wall, closing her eyes. Are you okay? he asked. She shook her head. Fine. It's not your fault. Trust me, I know. I've been down this road before. It feels like there's something you should have done to prevent it, but there was nothing. I don't... She began before correcting herself. She turned to him. How do we even have 29 more funerals? We'll find a way, Cass replied. We'll honor them all. She shook her head again, her eyes dropping. With green out... Cass pressed his lips in a line. I guess congratulations are in order... Though I wish it was under better circumstances. That's not what I was going to say. We've lost a lot of key personnel today. People are going to have to step up. Realization dawned on Cass. Oh, no. Wait a minute, he said, putting his hands up. She approached him, her eyes shimmering. I don't have time to debate this with you. I can't run the ship by myself... And it isn't like we're near a port where we can just swap someone new in. We're all alone out here until we get the engines fixed, and I don't have time to worry about proper procedure. You've done the job before. You can obviously handle yourself on the bridge. But, Evie, last time, last time was last time. Neither of us was in a position where we were ready to accept it. This is different. As of this moment, I'm promoting you to First Officer of the Tempest, with rights and responsibilities included therein. Congratulations, Commander. She stuck out her hand. He allowed it to hang there. Evie. He recalled her disappointment when he told her he wasn't going on the shuttle mission, and how he'd let her and everyone else down because of his inaction. He'd vowed never to let that happen again. The ship was in crisis, and they needed him and he knew Susanna would be proud he wasn't letting his guilt or self-loathing stop him from helping her crew. Because they had been hers, in a way. And by taking Evie up in her offer, he was fulfilling an unsaid promise. She was counting on him, and there was no way he was going to allow himself to fail. Not after everything they'd been through. Thank you, Captain, he said, taking her hand. It'll be an honor to serve. This has been Journey's Edge, Infinity's End, Book 4, by Eric Warren. Narrated by Larry Gorman. Copyright 2019 by Eric Warren. Production Copyright 
2020 by Eric Warren.